Welcome, guys. Welcome to Bible study. Whenever I can find an excuse to make those ladies get on stage and lighten the mood and make everyone comfortable, I do. So thank you, McKenna. Thank you, Christy. All right. What a fun group of ladies. I'm pumped to have you all here. Uh, if I didn't get a chance to meet you on the way in, my name is Rebecca Johnson, and I get to help run the women's ministry here. Um, Bible study is my jam. I think this is about the most fun ever created. So uh, I, because of that, people say sometimes I talk too loud and oddly enough, too slow. Like the more excited I am, the more I want to emphasize everything. So I'm coming in with awareness this semester to not yell into the microphone and to keep a nice steady cadence. <laughs> um, you guys are always lucky because um, I always do Sunday night Bible study first and then Tuesday morning. We switched kind of which one came first a couple years ago. Um, and so usually Tuesday morning talks are shorter than Sunday nights. <laughs> it's like, oh. So anyway, guys, let's, uh, let's just jump right in, get started with our study for this semester. Um, I am acknowledging that there are probably lots of different reasons why you signed up for Bible study. And I want to start off saying that they're all good reasons. So if some of you are here because you just wanted to meet some people, you're just, maybe you're new to town, new to the church, new to whatever, and you are lonely, and so you sign up for Bible study to make friends, that's okay. That is a good enough reason, and I think that you will get to know a lot of women and make those friends. Um, maybe you signed up because we're finally doing a New Testament study, and uh, you're like, good grief, Rebecca, about time. That's also okay. Um, but I was actually talking to Christy about this last week. I said, Christy, do you think that more people sign up for a more familiar book of the Bible or one that is more maybe obscure? Um, and she's like, oh, familiar, absolutely. And I was pleasantly surprised by that because in my mind, I'm like, the more obscure, the better, right? Like Joshua, like a battle book is always my preference, which is odd, but... Um, then we went with Ephesians because you guys, I don't know how many of you were part of Joshua last summer, but you guys were just like shouting out what you wanted to do next and Ephesians came up and that was the one I was like, okay, yeah, this is, it was some compelling reasons and, and that's part of why we're here is for some of the connections I actually saw from Joshua all the way to Ephesians. Um, but some of you probably signed up because you are familiar with this book, the, what I would call the best of. Ephesians might have been your reasons for signing up. So the best of um, would be those things that we see quoted a lot, you know, maybe like a half of a verse or a little quip or something. So think of the things that we either put on our graphic tees or tattoo on our bodies, depending on your personality. Are you more like a t-shirt person or like a tat person? But we see Ephesians on t-shirts, coffee mugs, and tattoos a lot, right? Like saved by grace through faith, um, stuff like that. Or my sister actually has immeasurably more from Ephesians 3.20 tattooed on her shoulder. I think it's pretty cool. Um, I think I was, I'm more of a t-shirt person. I don't have any tattoos and they still let me work at Veritas, which is a big deal. Um, but I did love to tell everyone how great Jesus was with my t-shirts in junior high. <laughs> I had I had this shirt that had a big basketball right here, and it said, Jesus Christ is life. The rest is just basketball. <laughs> and I had zero friends for fifth grade, but those were the two things I loved, basketball and Jesus. So those would be like the best of Ephesians, uh, things that are familiar to us, the foundations of our faith. Uh, if you were a kid that grew up in vacation Bible school, then you could not have gone more than a couple summers before hitting the armor of God, which is at the end of Ephesians. Um, but guys, there's also the worst of Ephesians. And I just want to be fair, because if you're here just thinking about the best of, you might be caught off guard as you read through Ephesians. Because in this book, 
we get called the sons of disobedience. We get called the children of wrath. And we are going to read in chapter 5, wives, submit to your husbands. Oh my gosh, so awkward. (laughs) Oh my gosh. The worst of Ephesians. Maybe not super tattoo worthy. Like son of disobedience on our bicep. But maybe you're here because Ephesians hits on some really challenging stuff. Tomorrow, you guys are going to read Ephesians chapter 1. And right away in chapter 1, you are going to run right into this word predestination. You are going to have to grapple with this idea of being called into the family of God before you were even born. Guys, you're not going to have a solid answer on that before Wednesday at dinner time. There are some things that are challenging in this book. But no matter the reason, whether it's social reasons or because a friend tricked you to get you here, or the best of or the worst of, I'm glad that you're here. And I know that the Lord has good purposes for it. So I want to go through some of the expectations for this study, knowing partly just so that you guys can know what you can expect from from me and the other leaders. Um, But also, I want to hopefully cast a vision of of what we expect from you as well. Um, So if you've done our studies a lot, then you already know a lot of this. It won't take more than just a couple minutes, guys. But the routine for the next um, five weeks is that when you come right at 9 o'clock, and you get your coffee, and you drop off your kids, if that applies to you, you're going to first go to your small group, okay? So if you didn't catch what small group you're in, who your leader is, or the space, we'll take care of that afterwards. But that's where you're going to go for the first 45 minutes, so from 9 to 9.45. Tuesday morning Bible study has a little reputation of not being very punctual. Or you do such a good job, and you get here, and you stay in the foyer for 15 minutes. So I love the social energy, but why don't you start that social energy in your small group, and then you can linger afterwards as long as you want, okay? We'll order in pizzas or the Mexican food, whatever, but try and get to your small group at 9 o'clock if you can. In that time, you are going to be talking through your homework. So in your workbooks, you have five weeks, five days a week. On those days, I would budget for half an hour a day. If you're going to do it, if you're going to break it up in five days. Guys, you could power through some of them and get them done in 20 minutes, I think. I mean, not if you think that's true of our studies. But you can definitely spend an hour, too, if you want to. Um, so it, it's, when I say half an hour, it kind of depends on your personality, your season of life, um, how much time you want to spend um, thinking or even like journaling out on the application questions. But that's what you can expect through your week. When you uh, look at your questions, you're going to see three different kinds of questions. Now, before it's all edited and printed out, those questions are actually labeled so that I have some organization in the writing. The first one is an observation type question, okay? Observation means, or ask the question, what does it say, okay? Don't stress about observation questions. Just look in the Bible and don't think that we're trying to trick you with the question. It's going to say, what does it say in verse 4? So then you look at verse 4 and you write it down, okay? Don't overthink it. Just look at the text. Those are observation questions. That's more than half of the questions in your study. The second type of question is an interpretation question, where observation says, what does it say? Interpretation says, what does it Mean, good. Okay, these, your cue that you're on that kind of question, it's probably going to start with, uh, why do you think? Or in what way? Or how? Now, I want to clarify something. These are challenging questions. Um, They're the questions that I come up with, like the question I have when I'm writing the study. I'm like, "I I don't know what that means. This is different than making up your own meaning in the Bible. That's not what an interpretation question is, okay? But what it's doing is is it's slowing your role so that you're not just trying to get through your homework as fast as you can or even just fill it with good answers, the right answers. We want you to sit in this space and tease out the question and consider what is happening in this part of the Bible. So why do you think? Again, it's not make up your own interpretation of the Bible. Why do you think this happened? Or what do you think the author meant by this? 
That's an interpretation question. And then the third is application. So we go from what does it say, what does it mean, to how is this going to affect my life? We bolded all of those questions so that like when you look at your day, it kind of like pops off like it's the dessert for your day. So we hope that you'll take your time. Um, you'll see more space on those questions to write out your answers. What does it mean in your life? That process is really important, guys. So um, some of the things that we try to avoid is jumping to application before actually working through that process in the text, okay? Because we don't want to uh, shortcut the process, but we want to make sure that when it gets to the life-changing truths of God's word, that we're interpreting it as it was meant to be interpreted. Um, and so one of the things that we talk about is the path of transformation. I don't remember where we got this. It's not original to Veritas Women, but our, the path of transformation is our minds to our heart to our hands. So what that means is that when we come together and when we work on our study throughout the week, we are going to push ourselves to lead out with our minds. Now, I, I think that you're all brilliant women. And I like to use my mind, but do you know that it's still not the most natural thing for me? I'm going to take out this earring, sorry. I'm going to be a pirate. Um, it's still not supernatural. It's not natural for me to open up the Bible and want to think critically. I want to get there and feel better quick about my day. And that's okay too. But I think our feel-good feeling will go deeper and last longer if we actually lead out with our mind. So we're gonna push ourselves to use our brains and then what we learn in our brains will then comfort our hearts, encourage our hearts, inspire our hearts, and then it comes out to our hands and changes how we live. What this does, guys, is it keeps us from just wanting to quick become better behaved women <laughs> with our hands because then we just end up burning out and getting really tired. So the path of transformation from mind to heart to hands. And then the third kind of posture in how we approach the Bible that I want to hit on is that we read looking for the big story of the Bible, okay? So we talk all the time about whatever book of the Bible we're in, it fits into a much bigger story, a story that starts on page one of the Bible in Genesis 1 and goes all the way through to the end of Revelation. This has been one of the sharpest and most exciting learning curves um, of my walk with God in the last decade, is seeing the Bible as one huge story inspired by God, but one plot line that moves through the whole thing, culminating in the person and the work of Jesus. So we're gonna be in Ephesians. And here's my confession about Ephesians, guys. It kicked my butt. <laughs> It was so, second awkward moment of the morning. It's okay. I, I do better if you just kind of poke fun at me than take me too seriously. I about like threw this one out a couple times. I thought it was so hard. And the irony is like, oh, I know Ephesians. I did vacation Bible school my whole life. But as I started studying it, I just, the layers kept coming. And I was like, what's going on in this book? Thus, pushing the whole study back a week because I was just lost until some friends kind of were like, pow, pow, pull yourself together, Rebecca, just push print. It's going to be fine. <laughs> but I do think that no matter how, how deep we go in the study, there's goodness for us. So just reading through Ephesians in one day, there is enough there for us to know God's love better and to walk taller and stronger. But we could also go six months deep into this study and still just barely be, just barely be unraveling the goodness that the Apostle Paul has in this book. Okay, so when I talk about the big story of the Bible, why that's really important for me in Ephesians is because it makes the book more accessible to me. And I'm wondering if that is going to encourage some of you. What I mean by that is I look at Ephesians and I see that it's an epistle. That's a letter, okay? The Apostle Paul is writing it to the church in Ephesus. And I find it to be really hard. But when I can remember that this was written in a real time by a real person to real people, and the story kind of comes alive to me, then it helps me understand it. And then when I anchor it in that story from Genesis to Revelation, and we go from Ephesians, like tomorrow you're going to be going 
to the story of Abraham. And that's going to help you understand Ephesians. Later in the book, you're going to be in the Gospels. We're going to be going to um, the parable of the prodigal son over and over again. So we're not going to be just in Ephesians trying to make sense of it, but we're going to be going backwards and forward in the big story of the Bible. Okay, so that's some of the stuff that you guys can expect, ways that you can kind of get in my mind and see why we built this the way that we did. Um, and it gets me excited for you guys too, because it puts you guys in a place along with me and the leaders that we're not just opening the study to get an answer for every question, but we're, we're going there to find the God of the Bible. So we're going there to look for more than just news about ourselves or more than just a pep talk. Pep talk. We're going there to look for God. Because the, the good news that doesn't sound like good news at first is that the Bible is not primarily about us. And that can kind of sound rude at first, but I actually guarantee that it's good news for us, that primarily the Bible is not about us. I am not the main character of this big story, and I am not the hero of the story. But when we can see that God is the main character, that God is the hero, actually we become way more curious. And actually, we marvel way more at this story. There's more splendor. We, we have more curiosity for the things of God's word. And when we do that, we actually learn a ton about ourselves. And Paul is wonderfully organized. For you organized women out there, Paul in this book cuts the book right down the middle. The first half of it is talking all about God's big story. And the second half, shows us what our place is in God's big story. So lead out with your mind. Lead out looking for God in the text. What can you learn about God? What can you learn about Christ? And then watch as the process works and it teaches you all about yourself. Ephesians has so much for us about our identity, but it's our identity in Christ. Okay, so as I was prepping for this, my poor family has to put up with a ton of Ephesians talk and last year, um, my son came home. They were at Faith Academy School last year. And so they would come home, and they would just drop this, these incredible biblical truths. And one day, my, we'll just say one of my sons, because I'm working on honoring their privacy. He comes home, and he's like, Mom, you're always talking and talking and talking about the big story of the Bible, and you, you, know, you just have so much to say about it. He's like, well, guess what? Here's the big story of the Bible. He goes, God made it. We broke it. Jesus fixed it. I was like, hey now, that's pretty good. And I sat there and I kept thinking about it. And I'm like, that actually covers the basics of God's story. And it kind of came back to my mind as I started studying Ephesians, that God made it, sin broke it, that Jesus has fixed it and will continue to do so. So with that in mind, guys, let's actually start Ephesians today before we go to small groups. We're, we're not going to get very far. We're going to get through one verse. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 is what we are going to start with. Um, quick little thing that you're probably looking for. We missed putting a note page at the front of the workbook. So if you like to take notes, you'll have to do it like on the back of one of the table of index or something like that. But the rest of the time, there is a note page um, for, for the teaching time. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 says, I, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, surely there's nothing there for us, right? Surely that's one of those verses we can just keep moving on. Let's see. I, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. He starts off with, I, Paul, introducing himself. So who is this guy? Well, I think that a lot of you guys probably are somewhat familiar with the apostle Paul. But let's slow down even a little bit more. Who is he? Well, we're first introduced to who 
Paul is in Acts chapter 8. So Acts is the story of the start of the church. So Jesus has already died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. And his church is beginning, and his disciples and his followers are spreading the word about God's kingdom. And where we find Paul, first of all, is that he is the one in authority over Stephen's stoning. Stephen was a follower of Jesus who was preaching and was uh, persecuted to the point of death. He was stoned, and it says that people put their garments at the feet of a man named Saul. Saul is who would become Paul. That's how we are first introduced to him, as Saul. That means that he was named after the first king of Israel. You ever think about that? So where we hear this name, Saul, is talking about King Saul way back in the first half of the Bible. King Saul, he was like the epitome of the Bible's tall, dark, and handsome, okay? He was uh, prominent. King Saul was powerful, important. Perhaps that is who Saul, our Saul, was named after. I mean, it fits him well. He was very much living up to his given name at least a couple years before he wrote this book. Saul, before Paul, was a distinguished leader among the Jews. He stood ahead above his peers when it came to zeal for his religion. He was passionate about upholding the Jewish law, the law of Moses, and he was determined to snuff out anything that threatened his religion. Until the day when God laid him out on his back, on the road to Damascus, the day that Jesus Christ hit him off of his high horse, quite literally. The day that Jesus revealed himself to him and Saul became Paul. That was the day that this man went from spiritual death to spiritual life. The man who was named after this prominent king of Israel now became Paul, which beautifully means small. He went from kingly Saul to small Paul. It's like he's beginning his letter to the Ephesians like this. I, not Saul, by Jesus Christ and the will of God. I, not Saul, who was once big in my own eyes, puffed up with my own power, drunk on my own glory and success. I, not Saul, but small Paul. He says, to the saints in Ephesus. So let's stop for just a second and realize that there is a lot of goodness for us right away in the first half of the sentence in verse 1 of our book. And let's just keep asking questions. Why do we care that it was Paul? Why do we care that he says to the saints in Ephesus? Is there anything for us to learn there? Well, let's talk a little bit about this city. So Ephesus was a port city right in what we would say is modern-day Turkey. Okay, so when, when you're starting to picture this in real life, think of this as we are going to like make a backdrop behind the letter of Ephesians, okay, to make it come alive to us. So we're going to start picturing what it was like to be Paul and what it was like to be in Ephesus. It's a port city, so don't think rural. Think a busy city with lots of trade If it's a port city, then let's think lots of diversity, people from lots of different backgrounds. This is who Paul is writing to. And he says that they are faithful. So to get us to understand this backdrop more, I'm going to actually take us to Acts 19 and 20 for just a little bit this morning. And you guys don't need to turn there. I'm actually just going to summarize it because I'm trying to make this shorter than Sunday night. So in Acts 19, what we find about is that Paul... After his conversion, he spent two years at least in the city of Ephesus, sharing the gospel and building a church there. We read in Acts 19 that um, he was able to appoint 12 men into leadership, and we find that the gospel was so effective there that they used this phrase that all in Asia had heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Okay, so again, that's coloring in our backdrop that this city has diversity, and even this church is going to be a diverse church. This is going to matter later. 
okay? So this is Ephesus in chapter 19. So it sounds like a really successful ministry. It sounds like, like one of the most successful little church plant stories you ever could hear. So then why should we be interested or curious that he says to the faithful saints in Ephesus? We find that in the second half of 19. So thank you for asking that question. Halfway through 19, we read about a riot in Ephesus. Here's what happens. It says, now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and to go to Jerusalem. He says, I've got to get to Rome. So he makes this plan. He sends some people ahead of him. He's got this whole strategy um, to move out. But here's what happens in Ephesus. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. The way meaning the gospel, the work of Jesus. For there was a man named Demetrius. He was a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis. And it brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together. So Demetrius gathers all of these other silversmiths who make these small statues of the Greek god Artemis. He gathers them together of similar traits. He says, men, you know that from this business, we have our wealth. Like, this is how we make a living, guys. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. And there is a danger, not only that our trade will suffer, but that the great goddess Artemis will be counted as nothing. And that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, from whom all Asia and the world worship. And from there, Demetrius and this group of silversmiths, they cause a riot. And it says that so many people start coming together and they go into the theater and they go into like kind of the hub of the city. And there's so many people with them. It says that they don't even know what they were there for. This is the nature of a mob so often. They don't even know what they're there for, but they keep yelling out this phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians over and over again. This huge mob, someone will stand up and try and silence it. They see that he's a Jew and they just push him aside and they just keep yelling this out. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Okay, What's going on here exactly? So guys, in the city of Ephesus, what this city was known for more than anything else was this huge temple to the garden, to the goddess Artemis. Artemis was a Greek goddess, the daughter of Zeus and the supposed brother of Apollo, if you know your Greek mythology. In the in the city stood this huge temple that actually became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And I have a little description here that I found uh, in my research that talks about just how marvelous, how glorious this temple was. I, it was the pride and joy of the city. So think like our hospital or Kinnick Stadium. This is how they held this temple. Um, and think how long ago this was. So this is very impressive to read, that there were marble steps in this temple that led to a 400-foot-long terrace, like a garden. Inside, there was over 120 60-foot-tall columns, marble columns. So that means we're talking more than six stories tall. So like more than half the height of our children's hospital. Guys, are you picturing how grand this building was? And inside this temple was a cold, lifeless, stony statue of the, guard, of the goddess Artemis. She was known as the goddess of fertility. She was the one who could give life and she could take it away. And because of that, she was often depicted, this statue, as a woman with multiple pairs of breasts. Now, in a junior high room of boys, everyone would turn beet red and giggle. In this room, we're like, that sounds horrible. <laughs> Who would ever want that? That would be horrible. But it was meant to depict that she is the giver of life. She was also like connected to being like an archer, like 
think of someone who would provide. And so she has like a little deer and a bow and arrow. So she's like half Katniss as well. This is the woman. This is the fake God to which this whole city revolved around. In fact, this, this temple was destroyed a couple different times, one time by a flood, one time by a fire. And the people of Ephesus would not even take like any financial help from the government, so to speak, because they took so much pride that they did it with their own money. They rebuilt it again. The temple of Artemis was known for its splendor, its majesty, and its glory. And we hear this mob yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis, the icon of love, the icon of life. In addition, as you're getting this backdrop, we read that Ephesus was known for its occult or for its dark magic. So this city that revolved around this temple was always about the supernatural or the mystical powers, magical beliefs, practices, and phenomena. And so now when we read that Paul says to the faithful saints in Ephesus, we get it a little bit more. Oh, this is a big deal that they are faithful to Christ Jesus. Verse 1, we have two big statements that we are going to pull through our whole study. The first one, ladies, is that Paul is no longer Saul. The second, there are faithful saints in a dark, dark place. Paul is no longer Saul. So someone who was hardened, someone who's hell-bent against Jesus has been made new. Somebody who was far off from God has been brought near. Someone who was ironically lost in his own religion has been found by Christ and made new. And secondly, a city that was filled to the brim with the worship of a false god, a city that obsessed over the splendor of a pagan temple and a stony statue, now housed this vibrant little church community. It now housed this family, this spiritual family that at first glance looked like plain people, but actually were filled to the brim with the splendor and the glory of their Savior. A family had been brought near first to God and then to each other through the power of Jesus. This is who Paul was writing to, and this is a situation in which Paul was writing to. And we are going to watch as he pulls the best and the worst of Ephesians all together and builds a brilliant letter, a compelling letter, a letter that is going to do so much in our lives. But here's just a couple to get you excited, to, to give you something to look for. The book of Ephesians is going to strengthen what maybe we already know. It's going to go over the foundations of the Christian faith, that we are saved by grace through faith. And maybe you're like me, and you need to hear that in a way that wakes you up to these wonderful uh, foundational truths from the Bible. And maybe what it'll do is it'll shake us or it'll comfort us or it will awaken in us a new desire to love Jesus. The book of Ephesians is also going to cast a vision for us and specifically it will cast a vision for unity. As both our vertical unity is explained, like how in the world can we be united to God and then a unity that goes horizontal, that because we're unified here, we find unity here, even with people who are not like us. And the book of Ephesians is going to point us to God's big story, because we're going to see the truth that God made the world, God authored the story, that we, like Adam and Eve, by choosing sin, broke the unity, and that Jesus has fixed it, and will continue to fix it. And after we do work like this, then we get to receive the application that this word of God brings us. 
more than anything, what we are going to be focusing on is what I would say is like Paul's thesis statement in verse 10 of chapter 1, that God is bringing all things back together. That God, through Jesus, is bringing all things back together. That he has already done that and that he will finish the work. That means that God is going to mend what is broken. That God is going to unify what is fractured. And we're going to look at how that applies to us in our relationship with God. And then we're going to look for the dozens of ways that it applies to our life beyond that. The dozens of ways that we want to experience unity, that we want to experience God's healing or God's unifying work. Guys, this is going to be one of many times that I want us to do a stop and be honest. Because it really doesn't do much good if we all just keep on our happy church girl face and nod along and say, "Mm -hmm, I know, isn't it great? Because if we're honest, so many of us on so many days would say, I don't feel like Jesus has brought all things together. That's not my experience right now. That's not my family's experience right now. That's not my past. And I don't know that I can see that in my future. In fact, things feel way more broken than fixed. They feel way more fractured than set right. And that's where we're going to land in our last couple minutes this morning, is we're going to be honest in the moments that we feel that way. Because we live in the already, not yet. What has already happened, guys, is that if you are in Christ, Jesus has bought your unity with God. If you've heard it a million times or you're hearing it for the first time, it is the most important thing you could ever hear. What has already happened is that God has made a way through Jesus for all things to come back together. You can be brought near to Christ. But what has not yet happened is the the fuller blooming of this truth. The reality that Jesus is still making all things new that heaven and earth will come together in the future and all things will be made right and tears will fall no more. But we're not there yet. This is where we are. We're in the gap. We're in the tension of the two. And this is where we feel in that honest moment that we're surrounded with brokenness. Maybe you feel it in relationships Maybe you have a broken relationship that feels so long, so lost that you have given up on it. Maybe you have a relationship in your life that just won't stay fixed, right? You've entered in and tried to unify a broken relationship or or make a, a caustic relationship healthier, but it just won't stay fixed. Maybe you have someone in your life that is just, they're unhealthy, they're difficult to love, And you want so badly to see that healing come for them. But maybe it's even more personal. Maybe it's in your own body, right? We talked about this briefly with some of our Veritas kids, and we even said a broken bone is an example that we live in between the already and the not yet, that things are still broken and awaiting their healing. But maybe you feel it because you have anxiety. Maybe you feel it because you've got the blues and you just can't snap yourself out of it. Maybe you feel it because you've just got these habits that you just can't seem to set right. You just can't seem to stand on top of. What is it in your life that reminds you that, oh, this is not the way that it's supposed to be? I see this in in so many lives of the people that I love around me. I see it in this room. I see it in my own family. I'm not standing detached from Ephesians, but very much I need the hope and the comfort of this book so that I can stand here as I await Jesus to make it all right. I can stand here with hope and courage. Because I know that in my last year and a half, I have experienced 
more mental health brokenness and more uh, sin that has come up in my life than maybe any other time in my life. I know that there are some of you that, that come to my mind that have had times in their life where they say, oh my goodness, it's coming together. Everything's coming together. Maybe someone who so wants to be a wife and a mom someday and finally has this man that is caring for her and loving her. And she says, oh my goodness, it's all coming together. And then she's surprised, gets broken up with. What is she to do in that moment to live with hope and courage? Two weeks ago, it became, again, obviously clear to me with somebody that I love very much who was working, making steps in her life so that she could get healthy physically and wanting to get healthy so that she could have a baby, something that was noble, something that you know, God made so many of us for. And she was feeling encouraged as she was taking these steps towards health, saying, oh my goodness, it's all coming together. We got so excited for her. Feeling those blessings of God just pouring out on her. And she got pregnant. And she was so excited that she told her best friends before she told her husband. And then she lost the baby. And in that moment, she became painfully aware that this is where we stand. Knowing that God has taken care of the most important thing in her life, and that is her salvation. But feeling the weight of this broken world. Feeling the weight of a lost child. What is she to do as she stands here, guys? How do we find courage? How do we find hope? How do we find perseverance? And whatever your version of this story is, whatever season of life you're in, that's our question that's going to push us through the book of Ephesians, is how do we believe? And how do we anticipate the goodness of God as he promises to us that all things are going to come together. As he promises that he makes all things new, that he mends what is broken, that he sets right what is wrong. What is it for you? Here's what I want to get you excited about. Two things that at least I chose to focus on for this first week. As you wait as you anticipate, as you wrestle with how to live out the message of this book, here's two things to think about. One, it is better to be Paul than Saul. Okay? It is better to be Paul than Saul. What I mean by that, guys, is I am going to promise you and the women around you are going to promise you that it is better to be laid out flat on your back by Jesus, even if you are humbled and wounded, but near to God, than it is to be puffed up and full of yourself. It is better to be Paul, then Saul. Is there an area in your life that you need to believe it and then act on that belief? Is there a wound or a pain that God has allowed to come your way that makes you feel weak, embarrassed, shameful? And what you need to do is to believe that even if you are flattened on your back, and missing how good it felt to feel prominent and successful and all put together. Believe that God is good there. And secondly, it is better to be in the meager and marginalized, persecuted family of God than among the crowds at the temple of Artemis. Can you believe that as we start this study? It is better to be among the plain and simple and humble people of God, finding your place in this divine family, than it is to be among the party and the crowds at the temple of Artemis. 
in the places that maybe would the world would say, this is where you feel secure. This is as good as it gets. This is true glory and splendor. I promise you that it is better to be among the people of God. Because Ephesians has told us that our biggest problem has been solved and our greatest need has been met, that God has unified us to himself through Christ. Our relationship with God need no longer be broken because of Christ. Why else? Because Ephesians will teach us that the splendor of Artemis or the glory of Iowa City or whatever the world is offering you pales to the glory and the splendor of God's church. And Ephesians is going to teach us that the powers of this dark world will not stand against the powers of Christ. And we will lean forward as we wait for the end of Ephesians, where we get to read those verses about the armor of God. And perhaps it's going to be those childhood memories of the armor of God, or the only verses that sound familiar to you that we are going to lean into as we know that we get, can stand, not because we're superwomen, not because we are good Bible study women, but because we stand in Christ. The book of Ephesians is all about union with Christ. You're going to see it every week in your homework. We're going to hear about it in teaching. And every week we're going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> I don't get it. Because union with Christ is kind of this vague amoeba of an idea that I am still just like chiseling away trying to understand. But what we can understand right now is that if Jesus is your Savior, that you are in Christ and he is in you and you are safe. Your spot is hidden in Christ, and you are part of the family of God. And that's where we stand right here. Knowing what has happened for us, longing for what will happen in the future, we stand in Christ, rejoicing and kind of marveling and wondering what it means that he would partner with us, identify with us, join with us, tie himself to us. That is our reality. That's our good news. Let's pray. God, I pray for every independent woman in this room, every woman in this room, not for the general crowd, but for the woman whose name you know, whose hurts you know, whose sins you know, whose hairs have been counted because you love them. I pray that they would feel safe in that. And because of that, I pray that they would feel safe and known and excited at this Bible study and in their small group as they open up your word that reveals you to your children. So we come and we're just thankful. We are just thankful for all that you've done and thankful for what you're going to do. Amen.